In this video, I'm going to share with you my five golden rules for finding opportunity on UK high streets. But first, my name is Ranjan Bhattacharya. I've been investing in property for 30 years and in retail high street property for the last 15 years. Uh, this is my channel. Uh, it's dedicated to helping you become a more successful entrepreneur. We publish new videos each and every week. So make sure you subscribe, hit the subscribe button on our channel right now and press that bell icon because the minute we upload a video, you'll get notified and you'll be able to see it first. Now, onto the high streets. Many say that the high streets are dying. I don't believe they're dying. I believe they're going through a period of transition. Buildings on the high street, many of them no, are no longer fit for their original purpose. Now, if you as a property investor and developer can figure out how to repurpose those buildings to find alternative uses for those buildings. You can not only bring the high street back to life, but you can also do very good for you uh, by making a good profit on those sort of investments. Now, in this video, I'm gonna share with you my five golden rules for finding those opportunities. The, the, it's from a talk which was recorded at the Baker Street Property Meet. I'm host of the Baker Street Property Meet. It's a monthly networking event for property investors and developers. Uh, we get 200 investors and developers passionate about property meeting every month. To find out about this month's event, uh, just go to the website bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. Links are in the description below. But anyway, on with the video. Um, Okay, thank you very much. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, five golden rules for investing in commercial property on the high street. Now this is quite interesting because a lot of people think commercial property on the high street is dead. Uh, there's not a week go by without stories, negative stories, about uh, high street retail property. Um, and for me, that is the best time to start getting involved. Uh, because what we are experiencing now is a period of massive transition uh, on the high street. And if you can see through all the waffle and you understand how to pick the right property, um, you can sort of have some fun. So what I'm going to share with you is five golden rules for selecting decent investable property uh, on the high street. But before I get into that, let's just talk a little bit about why the high street is changing. Now, we know about changing shopping habits. Everyone's going online. Everyone knows that, Amazon, eBay. I'm not going to sort of uh, dwell on that too much. But there's also this thing of um, people using things like business rates, Brexit, and online shopping as an excuse for poor management um, and financial incompetence. There are lots of um, what they call the casual dining restaurant chains, which have run into a lot of trouble because about seven or eight years ago, they took out a huge number of corporate bonds and corporate debt. And they haven't expanded as much as they thought they would. So these sort of casual dining chain Italian restaurant type things, I'm trying to avoid naming them, but you kind of sort of get the picture as opposed to family run Italian joints. Um, these sort of people have run into a lot of problems because it's not Brexit, it's not business rates, it's the level of debt that they took on uh, to fund an expansion program which hasn't materialised in sales. So a lot of those people are falling uh, um, under a bit of trouble. Banks. I mean, I think it's very simplistic to say that banks are closing because um, of the online banking. But there's also this movement uh, to cash. Now, I've seen a few bank branches recently. I've, we've picked up a few um, a, a last year. Um, the thing about these bank buildings are they usually have a vault in the basement where they used to store cash. And that used to be local high street shops and business people going to bank cash. Now, they don't need that anymore because they are, those uh, small shops aren't banking takings in that way. Um, in the, the ground floor of a bank is typically a banking hall. And again, that's been replaced by online banking. 
The upper floors used to be office space where you'd go to meet your bank manager and get a personal loan or something. Now that's all been replaced by call centres. So you can see how the whole real estate, every floor of a bank building has now become just defunct. Um, betting shops, this is massive. Um, anyone here um, play fixed odd betting terminals? Hands up. I wasn't expecting a huge show of hands to that question. I mean, you wouldn't be in this room if you were waste pissing your money up the wall like that. But um, I shouldn't have said that either. But uh, fixed odd betting uh, terminals, they, you used to be able to put 500 pounds or so in one stake. Now, um, the government, it, it used to be that the government's only restriction was that you could have two of these machines in one shop. So what a lot of the betting shops did is they opened up multiple shops and put two machines in each. Because these machines are the biggest earner of revenue for these people. Um, so uh, in North London, in the Holloway Road, where I do quite a bit of stuff, on a two mile stretch, they're about four William Hills. Um, because in every shop, they can put two machines. Now, these are going to be uh, massively impacted by the lowering of the maximum stake to uh, just two quid. Um, the, I can't remember the name of the Association of Betting Shops, uh, but they put out something saying that more than 60% of betting shops in the UK will not be economically viable simply because of this um, change to the rule. Um, business rates, um, of course, everyone knows uh, that as an issue. I think it's a little bit overplayed myself. Uh, it's much more to do with changing trends and whether the business model is valid, uh, which is the key driver as to whether a business uh, sort of stays afloat. Brexit uncertainty, I think, is temporary. It's an excuse for a lot of things, but um, people may be delaying taking on a long lease on a retail premises, but they're not stopping doing business sort of completely. So there's a lot happening um, on the high street. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is five golden rules for, uh, among all that mess, five golden rules for selecting the right uh, property on the high street. Now all of what I'm saying is based on an article I wrote in um, Property Investor News, but I do a column in there on commercial property uh, every month. So five golden rules to um, uh, finding opportunity on the high street. The big factor that drives uh, a high street is footfall. And that footfall needs to be reasonably prosperous. If it's not prosperous, then they ain't got any disposable income. It's as simple as that. Yeah? So I find that if you, if you find a successful location for retail, then it's much easier to find a, success, a business who will succeed in that location. And the way to do that is simply um, by looking for affluent footfall. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at, uh, I mean, one of my metrics is things like house prices in the area. How much above the average UK house price is the catchment area of the shopping parade that you're particularly looking at? That's just one indication of how you can gauge um, affluent. Um, the second thing you're looking at is vacancy rates. Now, you need to understand why shops are vacant on the high street. Um, now, there are many areas where it's not affluent. There's tons of vacant shops, and they've been empty for years. There's not much you can do with those areas, because the location is not a successful location. It's very difficult to get a business to succeed in a location that's not successful. Um, so one thing that comes up time and time again you find an affluent area with affluent footfall, but you see two or three shops on the high street which are still empty there. What you've got to do is understand the reasons why they're empty. Now, what I find, and this puts off a lot of people, is that they don't look. They just see a couple of two-let signs. They see they've been empty for a long time, and they think, well, why should I buy a shop on this parade if this guy hasn't let it? One of the most common reasons why shops lie vacant in affluent areas is because um, it's not a fresh lease. If someone, if a tenant leases a property on a 10-year lease um, and they decide to pack up after seven years, then they can, they can sublease 
the remainder of the 10-year term that they have. So what they have to do is they have to find a tenant who, who is happy to take it for the remaining three years left on the lease. And that new tenant has no right to renew. So why would anyone put the investment in taking that shop up if they've got no security after three years? So if a shop is vacant and you're looking at something within a few shops away, find out why it's vacant, find out whether it's on a fresh lease. Uh, often um, it isn't. So look for vacant, low vacancy rates and look for the reasons why. Um, this is very important, right-sized. Is the shop right-sized? Um, uh, again, if you, if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of this article if you want the text. It's ranjan at bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. Uh, but the links will be on the description on the video. What am I talking about? It'll be on there. Um, uh, right-sized. Now, even in prosperous areas, you're going to find things, uh, some of the large department stores, those shops are empty and they continue to be empty because they are wrong sized. They were built for selling products off shelves. Um, they often have very narrow frontage, you know, like the old BHS stores, for example, very narrow frontage, very, very deep and three or four floors above. And how would you split it? Because there aren't any natural light coming in anywhere to the rear of the building. They're very, very difficult units to reconfigure. And quite frankly, very few people have figured out a use for some of these wrong-sized shops because they're just too big. Now, I mentioned um, betting shops. Now, betting shops will represent a fantastic opportunity for the savvy property investor. Because if you think about the average betting shop, who's been in them regularly? Again, no hands go up. <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've, I've been in them for research purposes, <laughs> of course. Um, and, and complimentary pens you get as well. Um, but if you, if you think about the average size betting shop, they're not like the BHS stores, they're much smaller. You know? So the thing about those stores is they can often be made right-sized. If the store is somehow smaller, there are interesting permitted development rights that allow you to convert part of a shop into residential, or if it's in a secondary parade, all of the shop into residential. Now, many betting shops are actually in secondary parades. If you think about the betting shops that you've seen, um, some of them are just in, uh, they're, not in, they're in the main parade, but they're also in these second tier parades where there might be sort of five or six shops stuck in the middle of a residential area, and there's not much else going on there. Now, th those sort of units will be ripe for residential conversion. And you will see lots of landlords, particularly who have owned them for 20, 30 years, um, get scared at times of transition. Um, I love times of transition because there is always opportunity at times of transition. I think when I started in uh, commercial property, I was in North London around the Holloway Road area. And the big thing that happened there uh, this was in the early 2000s, late 1990s, um, was the Red Route. So the Red Route decimated a lot of shops that were reliant on customers parking their car outside, putting something in their boot and going away. Um, and loads of businesses closed on the Holloway Road. And a lot of landlords who had owned those properties for a long, long time didn't really understand uh, or feared that transition of the nature of the Holloway Road. Um, so they sold. And because they didn't understand that the, the, that the Holloway Road was just going through transition, they were willing to accept lower prices for those properties because they feared the future, they feared the future prospects, and they didn't value that real estate that highly themselves. But the key to this is finding alternative uses through the transition. So on alternative businesses to occupy the commercial or perhaps part and full conversion to residential. So the people that stay ahead of these trends will really come out on, on top um, as, as this transition unfolds. Do people see what I'm trying to give you guys a sort of flavor for? Um, width to depth ratio. Um, w one of the aspects of this transition <coughs> is a move from selling products from the shelves, that's all done online, uh, but services are done in person, 
you can't cut your hair cut, you can't have your hair cut over the internet yet. Um, now, uh, so, so service businesses are people oriented and when you walk past a service business, the um, um, pavement traffic likes to see people inside the shop delivering the service. So what they like, what appeals very well to those sort of shops, those sort of trades, is where the frontage is wide compared to the depth. Um, the, um, um, the rear of a very deep shop is not that important to a service sector business. So the opportunity there is to blend that with things like your permitted development rights, convert the rear space which is not valuable to service sector businesses to residential and maintain the front part as a service sector um, business. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the fifth thing to look out for is asset management potential. So when I'm looking at uh, anything on the high street, um, I'm looking at alternative uses. Alternative uses meaning can, that, can those premises be put to alternative commercial unit uses and or residential uses. The best sites have a plan B, plan C, plan D. And they're all so good, you don't really know whether to do either of them instead of your plan A. Um, one thing I find is that uh, when you've got options with a commercial property, then if you've got a tenant in there, you can um, get maximum rent on that unit, if that makes sense. So if a, if a rent, if a, if a shop lease is coming to its end and it needs renegotiation, and the tenant is saying, well, you know, Brexit, this, that and the other, I don't want to pay that much for it. If you've got a plan B which says, well, actually, I'll make plenty of money by um, um, making it residential above or a residential conversion, or perhaps you've got another better paying tenant uh, in line, then that allows you to get full market rent from your existing tenant. And that's a sort of very, very powerful thing. So, I mean, I've got a, one of the first properties I bought was a pet shop in um, the North London area. And um, I bought it thinking, this is North London, it's all going flats. Um, who needs pets in Zone 2 North London? Um, so I thought they'd be shut soon because that shop has plenty of residential conversion potential. Um, it's on a lease which has three-year upward-only rent reviews. Um, I bought this shop in 2003. Every th third year we've been implementing the rent review at the full market rate. Because I'm saying, well if you don't want to pay it, I don't have to discount it because I want to do residential conversion on it. They're still there. I thought they'd only, I bought it in 2003, uh, I thought they'd only be there for a couple of years because, you know, pets aren't a big thing in, in flats in Islington. But they're still there. But it doesn't matter because you've got a strong alternative use and a plan B, that allows you to be very bullish on making sure that you get the maximum rent from the tenant that's in there. If you don't have alternative uses, then you're stuck. What if the tenant says, I, I want a rent reduction? If you don't have another plan for it, what else do you say? Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much how you sort of um, play the commercial game. I think the high street is going to be full of opportunity. And um, whenever the headline writers write something, um, you want to look behind it. Because that scares off a lot of people, which means they're great sort of opportunities. Um, so um, again, the opportunities in retail, follow those five rules. Um, look for alternative uses, in other words, plan Bs. Um, and, and a lot of those plan Bs involve easily implementable pe permitted development rights. The thing with residential property, there are only a few things you can do under PD, and everyone knows it, single story extensions and all of that. The thing with commercial property is there's so many PD rights that not everyone knows all of them. Uh, there are some sites where there, you know, there's more than a dozen different permitted development rights. So which one suits that site best? Um, uh, and, and that kind of gives you a lot of strength. Um, Warren Buffet um, said this. I think this really kind of summarizes the opportunity in the commercial market space and more specifically residential um, today. Well, I hope that video was useful. 
It's the first of many that I'm going to be putting out there on investing in commercial property, not just retail commercial property, but offices and light industrial units as well. We upload new videos each and every week, so make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so that as soon as I upload, you'll be the first to receive a notification and be able to watch it. Anyway, until next time, happy investing.